Okay. Thank you very much for the organizing, for inviting me, and for the, this opportunity to talk with you guys. And uh, I'll start with a story, just to convince you that it, it, what we do is useful for drug discovery and why we do that. So I'll tell you the story of, uh, of a drug for insomnia. Well, it's midday insomnia drug. So <coughs> developed by Merck. And uh, Merck make a lot of effort. This is a new drug for insomnia. Came a couple of years ago. And uh, what I wanted, the message, the key message of what I was going to say that that if you don't have a, a method that will help you to understand the interaction between the protein and the ligand, you will do a lot of effort to optimize your compound. And if you look on the publications on the development or development of this drug. Uh, by Merck, you can see a lot of effort. And this is only part of the publications. So if you look on the... and Well, they, they, they work on this. They use it's a GPCRs. They use modeling of GPCRs. They looked on the interactions. And recently, there's a, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, there's a crystal structure of, the, of their compound came out, and uh, when we looked on this on the on the inter on the interaction, we couldn't understand anything. Because if you look on the compound on the binding affinities, it's a it's a super glue compound. It's 0 0.554 nanomolar compound. You would expect if you look on the structure, if you do visual inspection or force fields analysis, you will see maybe about one hydrogen bond, something hydrophobic, interaction via water molecule, that's all, like three interactions. You don't, you don't understand what's going on here. Why this compound is so, so potent, from where the potency is coming. And uh, I hope by the end of the presentation I will be able to explain this. But before that, I'll, go, I'll do some intro. The method that we're using to do QM calculations, and we're doing in industry, so industry is time is money, so it needs to be quick. You, don't, you can't wait months to get the answer, you need something very quick. So you can't do Q, usual QM calculations, because it will take months. So what we do is other method called for a FMO, fragment molecular orbitals. What we take, we take the, the system, we break it into the fragments, for instance, each Residue can be represented by the fragment. Ligand is also a fragment. The ligand itself can be break into also into fragments if you want to understand more specific the interactions. And then we may perform the calculation. <coughs> this allows uh, to decrease the dimensionality of the problem from n for uh, in power of three to n power of power of one. And this is actually what is adding a, a speed into that. This method is also paraly para para paralyzed, and uh, and since and, and which adding ad additional speed to that. So, but it's still not very quick relatively. But it takes a couple of hours per system. For about 32 CPUs, it will take about two hours to calculate protein ligand interaction per system. So what you get actually, what you, what type of in, uh, of information you will see with that, you will receive interaction energy between your ligand and or between actually every fra every fragment with every fragment. When we are more interested, obviously, interaction between the ligand and and the protein. The the interaction energy is is broken actually into four terms which one of them is electrostatics, which interaction between uh, charge residues, uh, between charged particles, and charge transfer is interaction between occupied and non-occupied orbitals, exchange repulsion, which is a repulsion between two occupied orbitals, and dispersion is in, in forces uh, between uh, multiples or uh, polarization uh, that are caused between two neighboring molecules. And the 
so you get and what you calculate you calculate the final then the total energy which is sum of those four terms so what you receive in the end is the list of interactions but not only that you will also receive what type of interactions which for instance dispersion is more hydrophobic thing electrostatic is more well electrostatic in nature is attraction or repulsion and this is something very more intuitive for the for the chemists uh, when we when they coming to to, per, to perform modification of their molecules we done some uh, some uh, exp some public we perform some uh, calculation on 18 of crystal structure of gpcr just just to see what we get we wanted to show in this paper there was two papers that i'm going to actually three papers that i'm going to, to speak today about them very briefly one of them we wanted to show that even if you have crystal structure in hand you need to you need a tool to understand what this structure is telling you there is much more you need a microscope to look on those interactions and those fmo is the type of type of of a uh, of, of this tool otherwise is you, you all what we count we count on mainly on our eyes which can deceive us or not or tell us or only partial part of the story and I'm, i will go into in second back to sovorex and to show you what actually we see there so this was published in 2016 this was work we done with Matteo and phil and the uh, other colleagues from ibotech and if we go back to Sovorexan, we'll take the crystal structure of Sovorexan, of this mer compound, you actually see that you have 10 interactions. With 10 interactions, you can explain why the compound is in sub nanomolar range. But only if you look on this. You don't see those interactions. If you so you this is the list of interactions, yeah. Per, this is the residues. Here on, on this plot, you actually see the breakage, the pieda of these interactions. So you can see that obviously yellow here is electrostatic term. There's obviously it's present, but you can see also blue dispersion term, which is hydrophobic and you see there is a lot of hydrophobicity here so there is a very hard to detect hydrophobic interactions on the other hand as you can see they are playing quite critical role <coughs> we perform also a correlation between took SAR from four different structures where we have experimental affinity and we, cal we calculated the correlation between the, affinity, the experimental affinity and the FMO calculated energy and we see quite good, uh, quite good uh, correlation. We don't expect perfect correlation because what FMO is calculating is enthalpy mainly, the interaction when, and ignoring the, the entropy, which is other, other story, which is very important, but is not part of the FMO. When we looked also on the distribution between different energy terms for 18 uh, GPCR ligand crystal structure, we notice that electrostatics is about 43% and hydrophobic is also about 40%. So we see that the role, the huge role of hydrophobic in binding which cannot be detected by eye. It can be, cannot be detected by eye. We, you can guess that you have hydrophobic interaction, but you don't sure about this, and you definitely don't know how strong this interaction is. And this is this is like, like we we are until without FMO, you you optimizing your ligand with one eye is closed, which was one half of the story you don't see. You don't see this also when you do crystal structure when you analyze in crystal structures. So FMO allows you to open, or QM allows you to open both sides and look on this to have a full picture. This is other also a, a case when we use FMO in a, to develop drugs against a asthma for kinase, ITK. It was 
project to, uh, together with Genentech. When they just wanted to bring you an example here, when we use FMO in prospective way as, as a real drug discovery project. So we started with the, with the HTS heat compound that was 460 nanomolar compound. When we perform FMO, you can see there is a residues in the binding site, but there is no interaction with them. So obviously in th this, uh, this is an example how you can use FMO as a, a, in prospective way in design of compounds. You look, you see what interactions you have, how strong those interactions, when you have, sometimes you have repulsion to make compounds stronger, stronger binding, which should not only adding interaction, but you should remove repulsion, which is also very useful. In this case, we looked, there's a residues that are, we are not interacting, they are neighboring. And you might think that you are, they are do interacting, but we, you don't. And then we finish with compound that was 4.1 nanomolar compounds when those interactions was present. And, the, and you can see that the, the, the type of this interaction was mainly hydrophobic, because there's, you see a, a large hydrophobic term here. We used, this is actually also a kind of perspective. You don't use FMO mainly for predicting affinity because you need a range to predict affinity. And to make a, a to, to build QCR, you, you need already strong binders. And when you have already strong binders, you don't need to do any more optimization. So it's always pros uh, retrospective analysis. But just to show that FMO do work, if you want to predict affinity, this was the, the in, in the project when we use this, and you can see the from do two series of compounds. We work on three series actually. This is for two series. You can see here quite strong correlation between the binding energy and the and and the measured potencies. This is additional examples for other series that we work on that you can not only take compounds for 460 compounds and bring it to, to, to nanomore range, but you can do also lead optimization in a manner when you have already strong compounds and you can still continue optimizing it by comparing not only where missing compounds, but also where missing interaction, but also where a interaction can be made stronger. So it gives you not only information, not only the fact that I'm interacting with this particular residue, but it also gives you information how strong you are interacting with this residue, and maybe you wish to make it stronger. And this is this is the example. When we have started with four nanomolar, finished with 0 0.17. Okay, but until now the problem with the FMO was it required high resolution structure. So it, if you're working on project, it requires that at least one crystal structure you will have. And then you can dock and do uh, other stuff. But, you, but usually this is a luxury. In the project, you don't have usually crystal structure. You work on your, for your particular ligand of interest. Usually do homology modeling. You do docking. And then where the QM most methods fails, including FMO. So what we wanted, we wanted very quick FMO. We wanted FMO that we can use in kind of way, like we use uh, minimization tools or even MD, something that can be very quick, mm -hmm. <coughs> in seconds. And recently we developed a method, actually we combined it with other method, DFTB. The method was recently, uh, the, we, we published this, the how it works, all the theory behind it. And uh, this was just accepted by Journal of Computational Chemistry. And just if you compare the speed of that, this is, if you use MP2 level of theory, MP2 method, then for different, for different, this is for, this is for instance, this is for S, uh, this silver accent that I talked about. It will take you about 19,000 seconds to calculate. When you do it with FMO DFTB, you get the answer in 12 seconds. <coughs> so the speed factor on average is about 1,000, more than 1,000 fold quicker. That's mean 
That means that you can start to use QM not only as an analysis tool, but you can use it as a as a tool to optimize. You can there is a few attempts was made to try to involve DFTB to use DFTB in uh, in MD simulations. So this way you don't need force fields, or at least you, we, we hope it will. You will not need to for, you will not need force fields. Maybe you, you because you calculate those parameters on fly from the system itself, from the change of the system. And this is something completely new, I think, and give us hope that all these MD methods we can be much more accurate. Again, we calculated with the experimental. There is a, a using FMO DFTB. We receive more or less the same result that we used with slow FMO. With FMO MP2, with DFTB, we get also high resolution. And we also see that if you correlate slow M uh, FMO with, with, with the quick FMO, you also have high speed. But I want to emphasize, the FTB is a different method than MP2. It's not light MP2, it's different. So the conclusions, uh, we have demonstrated that FMO is quick. It provides a list of interactions. This information is used in, in case of, uh, of EvoStack in industry, used to design new molecules. Helps to co have helps uh, chemists. It's decreased significantly, decreased the effort and cost, synthetic cost. Um, FMO, with the, the quick FMO, provide the same level of accuracy like a slow FMO. And it's opened a new avenue that we started to work now to use FMO, to use QM methods in a, as, a, as a modeling tools as a tools to, to, to minimize structures, to optimize them, and uh, in other, uh, like virtual screening, score molecules, because you have this increase in speed. I would like to acknowledge to Dmitry Fedorov, uh, who develop FMO, who collaborate with us, uh, to my EvoTech colleagues, um, to, to Andrea, that I am uh, collaborating now, to my genetic colleagues, and obviously CombioMed, BBSRC, to support this. And I want to also to, to say thank you very much for my former collaboration, Matteo and Philip, that we work very nice together. And thank you. And to you.